We're going to be going over the configuration of OSPF, configuration commands, obviously. We're going to have to know some commands to be able to configure it. Show commands to check out our work when we're done, see how it's operating, as well as troubleshooting OSPF in case there are any problems. In my simulator, I've got this diagram configured. Palestra 1, Palestra 2, and Palestra 3. Ethernet 0 on Palestra 1 has a 99.8 subnet. Serial 0 has a 99.32. Palestra 2, Serial 0 has 99.32. Serial 1, 99.40. Ethernet 0. And you can see that over here we got a .24 subnet and Serial 0 is connected to the .40 subnet. So by default, without any routing protocol configured whatsoever, what we see in here is what's going to be in the routing table of each of these routers. By default, by configuring an IP address and subnet mask on the interface and turning the interface on, the router will figure out what subnet it's directly connected to and put those in the routing table. Our job is to configure open shortest path first so the routers will communicate with each other and share this precious routing information. And how we're going to do that, we're going to keep it real simple with the area design. Everything will be in area zero. We'll go in and configure OSPF and take a look at it. Let me bring up the simulator. We're going to start at Palestra 1. I'm just going to go in and configure this thing. So if I do a show run, I can see that the IP addresses are configured, but nothing else is as far as routing protocols. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and enable OSPF. If I do a show IP route right now, which allows me to see the routing table, I can see both directly connected subnets, but nothing else. So we're going to go in here and configure OSPF. Now the command to enable OSPF is router OSPF 1 enter. This one right here is what's called the process ID. What that is, if I were to do that command again with a question mark, the process ID is a number between 1 and 65,535 and it's just a process ID to keep track of this instance of OSPF running on the router. The router keeps track of and can keep track of multiple instances of OSPF running on the router. Now, if we had another instance of run, uh, OSPF running on the router, a situation that might call for that would be you're migrating or bringing new equipment in or you're changing the network around a little bit and you don't want to mess up the way it's currently operating so you could bring a new instance of OSPF in and set that up. This number does not have to match on the routers. I make it match just to keep things simple, but I could put whatever number here because it is only a locally significant number, not a globally significant number. So I go ahead, type in router OSPF1. The next thing I have to do is type in the network number. Basically what I'm doing right now is I'm going to tell the router what interfaces on the router I want to be a part of a particular area. Like I said, everything is going to be in area zero. So I want all interfaces on the router to be in area zero. So all I have to do is type in what all the interfaces have in common. They've got a 99 in common. So I'm just going to go to 0, .0, .0 after that. And what comes next is called a wild card mask. They call it wild card bits here. You can feel free to call it a wild card mask. And it wants it in this dotted decimal notation. We will be seeing the wild card mask again when we get into access lists. But I'm going to put it in right now and then we'll go in and talk about it a little bit further. The wild card mask I'm going to put in is 0 0.255.255.255. .255 .255. Now, the zero means well, you're going to compare the IPs on the interfaces. The router is going to compare the IPs on the interfaces to this number right here. The wildcard mask tells the router what numbers here are important. 
The zero means the IP address on the interface must match what's in the first octet, which is 99. The 25 means I don't care what's in this octet. Don't care what's in this octet. Don't care what's in this octet. As long as the zero says to match the 99, so if the IP address on the interface starts with 99, doesn't matter what else, what else is in the other octets. As long as there's a 99 in that first octet, this statement will apply to it. And what this statement is saying is, I want you to participate in area zero. Done. Let's take a look a little bit further about what this wildcard mask is used for and how we can manipulate it. I'm going to bring up a slide. And wildcard masks shown here. And what it is, is I've got a router with multiple interfaces on it. So I've got interface Ethernet 0, might connect off to some other routers, interface Serial 0, Serial 1, Serial 2, Serial 3. So I've got a bunch of interfaces going off in this router. So it looks like a sun. The IPs on it, they all start with 99.8. So all interfaces start with 99.8. This interface has an IP of 4.1. This interface has four, actually di totally different set. Let's do 5.1, 6.1, 7.1, and 8.1. So those are the IPs on the interfaces. So again, they all start with 99.8, four through eight, going there and then a dot one for the IP on the interfaces and we're using a class C subnet mask so it's subnetted out to a slash 24 subnet mask. Now depending on what I specify with this wildcard mask down here will determine which of these interfaces match the statement. So here's my in interface Ethernet 0 here's the IP on it 4.1. If I just want this one interface to be in area 0, I use the network command 99.8.4.1, which is the IP address for this guy, 0, 0, 0, 0, meaning every octet in this IP address, 99.8.4.1, must match this statement right here. So what it's going to do, it's going to look at it and go, okay, 0 means must be 99 here is a 99 yes. Zero here means must match eight. Does that match eight? Yes. Zero here means must match four. Does that match four? Yes. Zero here means must match one. Does that match one? Yes it does. So this interface will be in area zero based on this statement. Let's check, take a look at the other face, interfaces. Here's 99.8. We'll do this one, 99.8.6.1. What will happen is it will check the 99.8. So far so good. However, it says, okay, third octet must be a 4. Is that a 4? No, it's not. That interface will not be in area 0. So 0 means must match. 255 means doesn't matter. If I want all interfaces to be in area 0 based on this statement, what I would do is I'd go network 99, 0, 0, 0. It really doesn't matter what I specify here because the wildcard mask is saying, let me check all interface IPs. This zero says must match 99. They all match 99. 255 means doesn't matter what's in the second octet. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. So as long as there's a 99 in the first octet, which they all have, they will be in area zero based on this statement. Now, here's one if I want to just put Ethernet zero, serial one, serial zero, serial one, and serial two in area zero and serial three is going to be in different area. So if I want to do that with one statement, what I have to do is I have to use this wildcard mask. And to see how this works effectively, I'm going to break it down into binary. We've got the 99.8. I know that's good because it says zero, zero, must be a 99, must be an eight, which they all match. But what this three does, is it does something that we really can't see without breaking it into binary. There's eight, or there's four in binary. So zero, 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 one, zero, zero, 
that is four in binary. And then the last one, zeros. So I'm not going to worry about breaking that into binary. And then here I've got my wildcard mask. I've got a zero, zero, and then three. So what three is, it's zero, 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 one, I'm sorry, zero, zero, zero. <laughs> Let me try that again. It's right there. One, two, three, four, five, six zeros. And then the two and the one turned on gives us three. And then this last one would not be a zero, it would be a two, five, five. All right, much better. So we've got two, five, five in this one, which is all ones. So basically, the ones start here and go over. It's the opposite of what your subnet mask would be. Subnet masks are all ones from the left to the right. This is all zeros from the left to the right, and then you hit the ones, and that determines what must match. So what it's saying here is every bit must match up until this point in the address. And so what happens is the 99, the 8, it's got to be the first five bits have to be zeros, and the sixth bit has to be a one, and then the last bits, it doesn't matter what it is. So what's saying is it can be this combination, zero, zero. It could be zero, one combination, one, zero, or one, one, which is four, five, six, and seven. They all match this statement because they all have zero, 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 and a one in the first six bits of this octet. Doesn't matter what the rest of the bits are because those ones are turned on in the wildcard mask. So by putting a three there, dot 255, it's saying four plus the next three subnets, five, six, seven, doesn't matter what's in the last octet, will be in area zero. So here's four plus the next three, five, six, and seven. So that's our wildcard mask, and we can manipulate that. Now, if I didn't want to worry about doing this crazy math down here, which is uh, four plus three, four, or seven minus four is three, if I didn't want to worry about having to figure out what number goes there, if I wanted to, I could simply do multiple network statements, one for each interface. I could go network 998400000255, or I could go 998410000, and then I would create another statement and do 51, and then another statement and do 61, then another statement and do 71. I can put as many statements as I want in there, so that's another way to do it. I could just make four statements and not have to worry about this wildcard mask math going on down here but again it's not hard and either way works fine let's get back to our router and finish configuring this OSPF so I brought my router prompt back up and again I typed router OSPF1 the process ID doesn't have to match on each router even though I like it too network 99000 0255255255 again this zero means the interface on the uh, the IP on the interface must match 99. The 255s mean it doesn't matter what the rest of the octets are. That interface will be in area zero. All of my interfaces on this router start with a 99, so they will all participate in area zero routing. So I'm done with that. Let's go on to Palestra 2 and Palestra 3 and configure those. So all I have to do is router. OSPF1 network. Same area. If I don't put the same area for the corresponding interface, then router A or Palestra 1 will not talk to router Palestra 2. And then I'll go and do the same thing on Palestra 3. So I'll enable this. I'll go router OSPF. 2000, just to show you that this number does not have to match. Network 99000. So they're all in area zero. Every router interface in this diagram is in area zero now. So I'll go in and check out Palestra 1, do a show IP route, and check out the routing table, and it is populated. 
So when we're looking at this routing table, the O means OSPF. 99.40.0.0 is the destination subnet. 110 is the administrative distance. This is the cost. 64 is the cost. And to get the cost, OSPF does a default calculation of 10 to the 8th divided by the bandwidth of the interface. 99.40.0.1 is the next hop or the router that it got the information from, not the next hop router. And serial 0 is the interface in which it came in on. 99.16.0.1, 99.32.0.2, where it's getting the information from for these particular subnets. And actually, this will typically just show the next top router. Here in the simulator, it's acting a little funky. Um, so serial 0 is the interface it came in on, and O is OSPF. This is destination subnet, administrative distance, and the actual OSPF cost. If I were having problems, things I would do to check this out. The first thing I would do is I would do show interface. If my interface is not up and up, then it's not going to function. So I'm going to take a look at my serial interface. It says is up, line protocol is up. That means layer 1 and layer 2 of the OSI model are good. Physical layer and the layer 2 encapsulation. I could just type in show IP OSPF interface and get the same information and more pertaining to OSPF. It says serial 0 is up, line protocol is up, just what I was looking at. What it also shows me is the area that this interface is participating in. And again, if the area on Palestra 2 router isn't zero, it doesn't match, they won't talk to each other, they won't be friends. The hello and dead intervals, again, must match. I can see that it's adjacent with the neighbor router is 9932.02. Everything looks good there. I also have the show IP OSPF neighbor command. It will show me my neighbor router. The state is full, so I know they've exchanged all their routing information. The neighbor ID is the IP address that represents the next hop router. And again, this IP address is the highest IP address on an up and up interface for Palestra 2 and this just happens to be the highest IP address on Palestra 2's interface. And I can see the interface it came in on so I can get information by doing the show IP OSPF neighbor command. So we've got that show IP protocol to make sure OSPF is configured in the first place and I can check out in the information about that. Here's the interfaces that OSPF is working on. I can make sure it's routing for the appropriate network. So these are very helpful commands here. Another command that's very helpful that is not available in this simulator, debug IP OSPF, and you've got a few different options here. Events I can do, and events issues log messages for every OSPF packet that gets sent. So I can see the packets as they come. I can debug IP OSPF packet. And this is describing the contents of all the OSPF packets. And another one is I can do debug IP OSPF hello so I can look at the hellos and make sure all the settings for the hello messages are right. Remember, the LOs are how the OSPF routers find their neighbors. They have to have matching information, otherwise they're not going to make neighbor relationships, thus not exchanging topology information. So those are a few debug commands. What happens when I turn debugging on, things will just start scrolling on my screen as these messages come in. If I want to turn debugging off, I go no debug all. If I have multiple paths to a destination, if I do a show IP route, and there's information in here, two paths to 99.40 going out of serial zero, and maybe I have a serial one interface, what I could do is I could go into an interface and I could use the bandwidth command 
and change the bandwidth or what OSPF thinks is the bandwidth on the interface. I could go ahead and increase the bandwidth. So I could go 200, it's bandwidth in kilobits. So I go 256 kilobits. I don't have to put 256,000. It's just 256 kilobits I can put there and increase the bandwidth. And by doing that, what would happen is if I had multiple routes to the same destination, OSPF would think that the route through serial zero might be a better or worse cost path based on the bandwidth command that I put in there. That bandwidth command that I entered, bandwidth 256, whoops, didn't mean to highlight all that, bandwidth 256 does not change the actual bandwidth doesn't have anything to do with what happens at layer one. What it does is it changes the calculation variable that OSPF uses to figure out its cost. Its calculation is 10 to the 8 divided by bandwidth. So if I change the, what OSPF thinks is the bandwidth on the interface, I can change what it thinks might be a better path to a particular destination. One other thing I could do on an interface if I go to interface serial zero, if I want to directly specify the cost of an interface, I could go IP OSPF cost command. It's probably not supported in this simulator. It is supported in this simulator and specify a cost for this interface of 1 to 65,535. That is an additional way that I can use to tweak the routing table and what OSPF would perceive as the most appropriate path from point A to point B. So there's a couple different ways I can go in and tweak the routing table as far as how OSPF is going to operate. And again, that may be necessary when you have more than one path to a particular destination. So I brought up this slide so we could go over these commands again. Router OSPF and process ID. Again, this is only locally significant. That's how I enable OSPF. And then I type network, the network address, the appropriate wildcard mask, area, and then an area ID. This is globally significant. If the area ID does not match my next top router that I want to share the information with, then it's not going to function. IP OSPF cost interface allows me to tweak the route that will end up in the routing table by placing a cost on the interface. Bandwidth, and then the bandwidth number, again, it's 10 to the 8th divided by bandwidth, allows me to manipulate what OSPF thinks is the best path as well. IP OSPF hello in seconds allows me to change the hello timer on an interface. And IP OSPF network and then the interface type allows me to specify how OSPF is going to view an interface as far as determining a designated router or not. Again, that command we went over in more detail in the designated router video with OSPF. So in this video, we have gone over OSPF configuration, the different configuration commands, show commands, as well as those debug commands that will scroll a bunch of stuff on your screen, troubleshooting OSPF, different things to look at, as well as a couple additional commands to tweak the way OSPF you puts routes in its routing table with the bandwidth and the cost on the interface.